Well, hello everyone. This is Mrs. Hansen once again. Today we're starting a new chapter, our second chapter in organic chemistry with the title of Molecular Representations. We will be looking at a variety of different ways to portray molecular compounds, organic compounds, on a piece of paper. So we'll begin with talking about what are molecular representations and how do we draw those using what's known as a bond line structure. The third section is identifying functional groups, which really will involve, in my mind, a, a set of flashcards and some memory work, and also talk about uh, carbon atoms with formal charges. We'll then move into identifying lone pairs of electrons, just making sure we can look at some of these line structures and understand where there are lone uh, pairs when even though they're not drawn. We'll practice drawing three-dimensional bond line structures using a dash and a wedge. And the last part of it really is a lot of work with resonance structures. We'll introduce resonance and the use of curved arrows. We'll talk about formal charges and resonance structures and use those to determine the most important contributor uh, in a series of resonance structures. And we'll talk about a resonance hybrid and then finally wrap it up with determining if we'll have localized or delocalized electron pairs. So I kind of color coded the sections to kind of go through which lessons will cover the sections and hopefully I can stick to that in the time limit. The beauty of a video lesson is being able to pause, rewind, walk away, come back, and kind of go through the lessons at your own pace. So as we think about um, those things that are going to be required of us in our lesson, I'm trying to advance the slide, here we go. We know that each chapter is really the same set of assignments. So the activities and assignments are creating your handwritten outline of chapter two based off of our video lessons or your face-to-face -face lessons or, and or reading from your chapter. So all of those are just dependent upon your preferred um, and you know your learning style, what works best for you. Practice with the Orion questions. I will tell you those students who achieve A's or B's in this class use the Orion questions before they start their homework and certainly before they take their quiz to help build mastery. That feedback is invaluable. Your Wiley assignment, um, again by a firm due date, and then of course the proctored multiple, chess, uh, multiple choice quiz by the due date as well. So those are going to be standard pattern as you operate through the course. Let's go ahead and dive in. In our first section, we're learning how to represent molecules by a variety of ways. The first way that we noticed is given to us in what's called a Lewis dot structure. So with this Lewis dot structure, this is what we practiced, let's say, from uh, last, oh, last chapter when we were working with, um, you know, recognizing all kinds of different variety of shapes using the Vesper theory and so forth. So every single bond, every single lone pair, all of the connectivity is drawn out. In a partially condensed structure, notice what we're now able to do is eliminate all the single bonds between hydrogens and carbon and just simply place them next to each other. So instead of having to draw all these single bonds out to the hydrogens, we've condensed that to say there's three hydrogens on that carbon and we know they're all single bonds. In a condensed structure, notice this was partially, but a condensed structure now is going to eliminate all single bonds and just show the grouping between those carbons and hydrogens. For instance, this carbon in the center has two identical methyl groups, so we see that CH3 taken twice. That carbon also has an OH group attached to it, and it now has a hydrogen as well. So this carbon with its four single bonds has been written in a condensed structure. And then the simplest of all, the molecular formula, which simply tells us the number and kinds of elements in the compound. So I know there's three C's, eight H's, and an oxygen in that molecular formula. So what information is necessary to accurately describe this molecule? Which ones are the easiest to draw? Which one gives us the most information? So just to kind of highlight what we said, here's some advantages and disadvantage. That Lewis dot structure, the advantage is clearly I can see every single bond, every single atom, every single lone pair explicitly drawn out. 
but their disadvantages, well, they're really only practical for very small molecules. I certainly want, wouldn't want to write large organic molecules, which they can be, uh, and show every single bond with every single lone pair and so forth. The partially condensed structure, where we eliminated the CH bonds and wrote the hydrogens directly on the carbon they're attached to, is easier, but it's still only practical for very small molecules. And if we go condensed even further and eliminate all single bonds and just groups of atoms that are clustered together, we're still only looking at practicality for very small molecules. And probably the least informative of all is the molecular structure because it gives us no insight into the structural connectivity of the atoms. We have no idea what type of functional groups are present, uh, the order of bonding, so it's the least informative. And so as we think about ways to represent molecules being a complete Lewis dot, a partially condensed, completely condensed, or the molecular formula, that least informative molecular formula gives us very little information. For instance, this formula, C3H8O, actually has three different isomers that it can represent. The term constitutional isomer, boy, will you be hearing a lot about that in this course. A constitutional isomer, we need to know that term. It's defined as the molecule that uh, molecules that share the same molecular formula, but they're connected in a different order. Notice this term here, isopropanol. OL, we're learning, is the alcohol functional group. That's this OH functional group. And if it's on carbon number two in a three carbon chain, we'll learn that it's called isopropanol three carbon chain with an OH functional group on carbon two. This has a molecular formula, C3H8O. Well, so does the term propanol, propaneol. Hear that OL ending telling us this is an alcohol functional group. And we're also learning that the prefix prop represents a three carbon chain. But this time, well, I should number in order of priority so we get better at that habit. The first carbon in order of priority we'll learn is the one with the functional group on it. But there are three carbons there. And if the OH is on carbon one instead of carbon two, it still has the same molecular formula. And here's a completely different functional group in this structure. It's called an ether. And again, since we're going to be practicing functional groups here in a moment, we might as well start hearing the words now. On one side of this oxygen is a methyl group, one carbon. On the other side is an ethyl group, two carbons. And the ether, which is the oxygen linkage here, is part of the backbone itself. This shares the same molecular formula, C3H8O. So all three of these structures have the same molecular formula, and therefore we really don't know what kind of functional group or where it's located based on that. So molecular formula is least informative. Let's do a little practicing. Here is a condensed formula, and we're asked to draw the Lewis structure for the following compound. So we're kind of looking at this condensed formula and going to the Lewis dot. And so what this has us doing is really practicing in our minds. When I look at a condensed formula, I still have to envision connectivity. All right, so I have to see what this molecule looks like. So as we think about this, we have a unit of CH3 taken twice, meaning that this particular carbon, which we know carbons must have four bonds, so if I just highlight this blue and let you know that's the one I'm, I'm starting with, and the reason is, this carbon with its four attachments, two of them are going to be methyl groups. CH3 taken twice tells me that those two methyl groups are connected to that carbon. So I have CH3, notice I'm drawing every single bond out for the Lewis dot. I have another CH3, and that's what that means by that CH3 taken twice 
this particular carbon has two methyl groups attached to it. You know what else it has? It has this hydrogen as well. Then I see that it's connected to this oxygen. That's this oxygen connected to the uh, oxygen directly so that we see that fourth bond. And we know that oxygen will have two bonds and two lone pairs. From there, we see a next carbon, that's this one, and then the hydrogens that complete its octet. And we have the final hydrogen in that terminal chain, of course, will require three hydrogens to complete its octet. So we managed to go from the condensed formula to the complete Lewis dot structure showing all bonds between hydrogens and carbon and all lone pairs where needed. By the way, we might as well practice this ROR, where R represents the alkyl chain, the carbon-hydrocarbon chain. This ROR, we'll learn, is called an ether in terms of its functional group, coming up in a future section here pretty soon. So that was our answer there. We had a methyl group on either of these carbons, an oxygen linkage, and two more carbon chains to the right. Here is some directly from your homework where I thought I would practice some just from your skill builder assignment. We have a letter A, a B, and a C. Now let's try to look at letter A first. I have one, two, then an oxygen, so let's kind of think about that. And then I have three, four, and then a chain here. So I'm just, I'm just kind of counting carbons before I start to see anything interesting. Let's write out that first carbon. And notice that it has a double bond. And so I can think about sp2 hybridization. This will be trigonal planar. And so I'm just kind of reminding you as we create our bond angles, I know that sp2 is going to have kind of this 120 degree bond angle. So a carbon, double bonded to a carbon, has that particular feel as I draw it out. Now on this second carbon, I have a hydrogen attached and I have an oxygen attached. See how I'm reading that? This carbon must have four bonds. Two of them are involved in a double, the third is in a hydrogen, the, third is, the fourth is to the oxygen. Oxygen requires two lone pairs and a second bond. The second bond is going to a carbon that will contain two hydrogens. It goes down to a next carbon, which is here. And this carbon, notice this taken twice, that means this particular carbon to have its four bonds. We might as well draw the four bonds. Two of the bonds are the same. They go to methyl groups. And I have to draw out all of those hydrogens because I'm required to do the complete Lewis dot structure. So two of these will be CH3 groups. And the last one here is the hydrogen. That represents the complete Lewis dot structure for structure A. Takes some practice, doesn't it? Let's try another. Let's do letter B. Again, these are from your homework, so the more we do together, the better off homework goes. I have a CH3, CH2 inside of a parenthesis taken twice. That tells me that it's attached to that particular carbon. I know that that carbon is going to have four bonds. Every carbon has four bonds. And so if I just get them ready, and they're all single bonds, so I can kind of just get them ready. Um, one, two, three, four. I have a CH2 group and a CH3 group on two of those three bonds. There's CH2, CH3. I'll have to have another CH2, CH3. And that represents the first parentheses there. CH3, CH2 taken twice is attached to one of these carbons. Now, the fourth bond is to a, I'm sorry, the next bond is to a hydrogen. And I'll just place that here. 
and then the next bond goes to this particular carbon. So this is a carbon backbone. So that carbon will have two hydrogens on it, leading to another carbon with two hydrogens on it, and leading to an OH to give it its fourth bond. Notice I have to put the lone electrons on the oxygen. So there's our backbone when we think about the, the backbone, one, two, three, four carbons in that particular chain. Here we have another carbon to carbon bond here. We have a functional group of an alcohol at the end. We had mentioned this was the functional group called an ether. Here we'll learn that this is a functional group called an alkene, a double bond. These are coming up, so I'm just putting them ahead of time. And how about letter C? This time I have CH3, CH2 taken three times. That tells me that this carbon, which has four bonds, three of them are identical. Three of them are going to be one, two carbons, CH3, CH2, there's the first. Notice that it doesn't matter because these are all sigma bonds, how they're pointing. They twist and they turn just so the number of bonds equals four. This will have a third bond of a CH2, CH3. So I'm drawing all the hydrogens to make sure each carbon has four bonds. And so what I've just done, just to kind of highlight the color, this particular carbon has four bonds. Three of them are going to CH3, CH2. This carbon is this carbon here. And I have a CH2 group, CH3, CH2, CH3, CH2, CH3, three, three groups of that ethyl. And now we need that fourth bond, and that fourth bond is going out to this alcohol group. This is the functional group called an alcohol. And there is that Lewis structure for letter C. I wanna take these one by one. When you look at the structure, here's letter A. This is what we drew, kind of cleaned up to make sure yours matches mine. Again, letter B. This is kind of cleaned up, make sure that yours matches mine. And in letter C, final answer, is a little bit cleaner to make sure yours matches mine. I got a little lazy and didn't draw my hydrogens, did I? Caught my eye when I was creating that. I need all those H's drawn in to be correct. Might as well take a minute and do that now. There, there's an actual bond between O and H. Okay, good. So we practice going from a, a condensed structure to a Lewis dot structure in that particular skill set. Lewis structures are too impractical, as we're beginning to see, they get tedious to represent certainly large compounds. Who wants to draw a structure such as this for amoxicillin? See how long that would take? But its condensed formula would tell us very little about its shape as well. So if I just started to tell you how the, ox how the carbons and hydrogens are connected in a condensed structure, I'm losing insight into connectivity, and it certainly becomes more uh, visually important to be able to see the functional groups. And so we introduce something known as a bond line structure. So here is what just the previous slide had a Lewis structure, every single bond drawn out, every single lone pair drawn out, very tedious, but oh my, so important, so informative. Now the bond line structure, sometimes you'll hear it also called a skeleton structure, skeletal structure. It's much easier to read and oh my, so much easier to draw. So the bond line structure 
kind of takes all these carbons and turns them into lines. And we know that every carbon is found at a junction of two lines. We see double bonds between carbons located there. Here's a double bond, here's a double bond. We can clearly see functional groups very quickly. A functional group of a, um, here this would be an amide, this would be an amine. Here we have an aromatic benzene ring. This is an alcohol. Here's a carboxylic acid. Here's a sulfur group. See what we're able to find very quickly. So this is our goal, is to be able to take these dot structures and turn them into line structures for ease of drawing. So let's take a peek at representing these in terms of bond line structures. As we begin to look at these, bond line structures are the benchmark for all of these organic compounds. It's truly what you'll see presented in any text or literature. It's critical to know how to draw them and it's critical to know how to read them for success in any organic course. So for instance, even though I don't see them, I know there's two lone pairs of electrons on oxygen. I know that because oxygen requires two bonds and two lone pairs. Even though they're not there, I know they're there. I know that nitrogen has a lone pair of electrons because nitrogen, who lives in group five, requires three bonds and a lone set of electrons three bonds and a lone set of electrons. So that's going to be part of the skill in this chapter as well, is recognizing when I need a set of dots to complete the octet of each of these atoms. So that's really another kind of interesting twist, is, is eliminating lone pairs and yet recognizing when they're really there. And the other thing you notice is that all the hydrogens connected to carbon are missing, but again, we know they're there. For instance, this is a carbon, it's only got one bond, so therefore I know it also has three hydrogens on it. No sense having to place them there, we know that they're there. So let's learn how to read bond line structures. First of all, each corner or end point represents a carbon atom. So the end point, one, two, three, four, five, six, as well as each corner of this um, zigzag format are indeed carbon atoms. So there's six carbon atoms in this molecule we'll learn to call hexane. Hex is the prefix given to six carbons. We can see that there's a double bond in this molecule here called 2-butene. At carbon number two and carbon number three, we see a double bond. And here we see an alkyne, so this is what we call 2-butyne, which is a triple bond. Notice we, we learned that this is 180 degrees for an sp carbon. Even though this isn't written, we know there's a hydrogen there, and we know there's a hydrogen there. So this would be 120 degrees with an sp2. And even though they're not written, we know they're there. There's hydrogens here. This becomes an sp3 tetrahedral. And that's why the zigzag line. So we write zigzag format for any sp3 or sp2 hybridized atom. But we make sure that any sp hybridized atom comes out linear, just based on its molecular geometry. Carbon atoms are not labeled, but we know they're carbon every time we locate a corner or an endpoint. And again, hydrogens bonded to carbon are not drawn. However, hydrogens bonded to any other atom must be drawn. That's what this one is saying. Notice that here, if you would look at this bond line structure, kind of how to interpret it. They're saying, let's just examine this particular carbon for a moment. That carbon has two bonds leading out to other carbons. Therefore, the other two bonds that aren't denoted in the structure, but assumed to be there, are indeed hydrogens. Here's a carbon. It already has two bonds, so the third and fourth must indeed be hydrogens. This carbon has only one bond to another carbon, so therefore we know that there's three hydrogens. 
And this carbon already has four bonds, so we see no hydrogens at all. And the last one here has a bond to a carbon, leaving three more open for hydrogens. So again, just for ease of drawing, we don't show the H's, but we assume to know that they're there. When we identify the location of carbons and hydrogens in the skeletal structure, in your mind's eye, you should see where hydrogens are and where they're located, how many are needed to complete the octet. And that's really what this next skill builders is going to practice. If I look at this particular carbon, I know it has three hydrogens. This particular carbon must need two hydrogens, two more, two more, two more, and finally a third carbon. We have CH3, CH2 taken one, two, three, four times, and finally a CH3. This would be the condensed formula for that structural formula. This particular carbon needs a fourth bond. This carbon and this carbon are terminal positions, so they need three hydrogens. Two more here, two more here, and three more here. So this carbon, which has a hydrogen, is also attached to CH3 taken twice. The four bonds on this carbon lead to two methyl groups. So you see that written as CH3 taken twice, CH. Then we have one, two in a row of CH2 and then finally CH3. This carbon is missing a hydrogen. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, one, two, three, one, two, three. So we can see how to do that. And that's really what the, the skill is in your homework right here. This is one of your homework questions where it says, fill in all the missing hydrogens on the carbon that are present in this molecule. So anytime you see a bend, two lines coming, coming together, these all represent carbon atoms. And I'm just gonna highlight them all in red. I think I found them all. So all of the ones highlighted in red are indeed carbons. So inside the cyclic structure there, I see a couple of nitrogen. So those of course are not carbons. And then the game simply becomes, make sure each one of these has enough hydrogen attached to give it four bonds. So this would again have three hydrogens on it to complete its octet. Let's just go down counter, we'll go clockwise. This carbon here already has four bonds. This carbon needs two hydrogens to complete its octet. This carbon already has four bonds, so that one, no H's. This carbon has four bonds, no H's. This carbon, one, two, three, four, has four bonds, no H's. This carbon, one, two, three, this will require a hydrogen. One, two, three, this requires a hydrogen. One, two, three, there needs a hydrogen. One, two, three, those are all the same, aren't they? Let's go up this. We have a, a carbon here, one, two, three, so he'll need one. This carbon already has four bonds. This carbon will need one more and one more. That carbon already has four bonds. So we found them all. So by the time we were done counting each carbon and located how many hydrogens to complete its tetravalent requirement, four bonds, you ended up drawing a structure that looked like this. So there it is, one of your answers for your homework right there. Do you feel comfortable with that? You wanna try a couple more? Here we have a, a carbon chain. And again, I'll just use red to denote where all the carbons are located. We have two terminal ends here, and I'll just place little lines where that will represent where the hydrogens go. We have on each terminal carbon, which means at the end of the line requires three hydrogens. Here we need two more. Here we would need two more. And finally, a terminal carbon requires three H's. This is what we call a bicyclo 
alkane. In other words, there's, there's cyclic structures. There's two of them fused together. These two carbons are part of two separate cyclic structures. One of the cycles, cyclic structures comes up and the other part of the cyclic structure comes around. So when I look at this carbon, highlighted in red, I'll say, it has one, two, three bonds already, so it will need one hydrogen. This carbon has one, two, three bonds already, so it will need one hydrogen. Each at these corners require two more, as does the carbon up front. So that's what our structure will look like, completed with all of the hydrogens to complete its octet. Let's talk about drawing bond line structures. Rule one says, if you have an sp2 or an sp3 hybridized atom, it should go in a straight chain. Now sp2, keep in mind, that's a carbon to carbon double bond. sp3 is a carbon to carbon single bond. They will follow this zigzag formula. So here I have a, what we call a quote, straight chain made of four carbons, but we know it's not really straight because it has a tetrahedral molecular geometry. And therefore we know that it's gonna be zigzag. Here's carbon one, two, three, four. So just up, down, up, down, until you get the number of carbons from that straight chain. Rule number two. When drawing double bonds, draw all bonds as far apart as possible. So you can see here, we're going to learn that this is called a carbonyl functional group. When we have a C double bond O is a carbonyl carbon coming out to a double bond oxygen. Notice that I want to give it all the room possible. So I wouldn't want to crowd it between the zigzag that's up and down. It doesn't have as big a bond angle as we would if we placed it up on top of there. So just give things room to move. Rule three, when drawing single covalent bonds, it absolutely does not matter which direction the bonds are drawn because these are sigma bonds, and we know that sigma bonds have complete freedom to rotate. Where we know pi bonds are rigid and do not move, sigma bonds rotate, which simply means they freely move. They rotate in space. So what's important is that we notice one, two, three, four, five carbons in the longest carbon chain, and at carbon three, we have a methyl group, a one carbon chain. One, two, three, four, five. We have the same length of the chain. We have at carbon three, a methyl group coming up. Literally all we've done is twisted the bond at carbon four, and we've twisted the bond at carbon two, so instead of pointing up, they're both pointing down. Very, very uh, legitimate configuration. Rule four, all heteroatoms, and that term heteroatom refers to anything other than a carbon or hydrogen in these functional groups. They have to be drawn, and you have to include the hydrogen attached to them. So here we have a functional group called a hydroxyl group. It's an alcohol. I have to include the hydrogen on the oxygen, but I am allowed to drop all the H's that are attached to carbon. And rule number five, which they call the cardinal rule of all, never draw more than four bonds to a carbon atom. Never break the octet rule, really for any element in period two. They don't have D sublevels to expand uh, the octet. So really, instead of saying just carbon, I'm going to say any element in period two, you know, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, none of those will ever be able to expand their octet. So never give them more than eight electrons. Let's practice a little bit with some homework questions. Skill Builder 2.3.
Here we're just asked to draw bond line structures for the following compounds. So I thought with this first one, we'd kind of take a look step by step of, of, of eventually uh, leading you to be able to do this skill. So this, this compound might look overwhelming, right? I, I see I have one, two carbons and an ether linkage. Here's another carbon and we know where to begin. So I have, you know, here's carbon three, four, five, six. All of these things are just kind of overwhelming. So one of the first things I, I is I'm a beginning student trying to think about what this really means. One of the first things I recommend doing is just eliminate the H's, redraw it, but eliminate all the H's that are not on a functional group. And kind of let me share with you what that looks like. So let me just kind of focus the attention here. So this was that original structure. This is from the previous page. And I said, one of the first things I recommend doing is just delete all hydrogen atoms, except those bonded to functional groups, like the oxygen here. I have to keep the OH. But see how cleaner that looks now? So what I'm saying is just take a look at each one of these in, in the sense of eliminate, eliminate, all of these hydrogens that are connected to carbon, just redraw the structure, but eliminate anything that's HC bond. And now we get a cleaner look at what we've got to do. So the second step, after I kind of eliminate and, and get a better clean view of all the carbons in the backbone of the molecule, it says now begin by placing it in a zigzag arrangement. You know, make sure that any triple bonds are drawn linear. So this right here has to remain linear, but all of the others should come out zigzag. So notice this carbon. I start just going up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down the entire structure. I keep this part straight. And then again, I go back to up, down, up, down. And that's really a tail there. So think about then placing it into a zigzag line. Anything that is single bonded or double bonded remains in a zigzag, but if it's triple bonded, it must remain linear because that's SP hybridized. And then the final step says, go ahead and redraw that now, and this time get rid of the carbons and just make those zigzag lines to represent the carbon atoms. So here we have, just kind of highlighting, this carbon is here. Here's the next carbon. Then we see that oxygen linkage. We'll learn that that's called an ether. The next carbon we see is here. Notice this carbon is part of a triple bond. That's this and this carbon and it still comes out linear. So the next carbon is here, the next carbon here, and then we have two tails to account for, CH3, CH3, and those are drawn there. So that's the process, and you don't have to draw each stage, but mentally that's kind of what you're working for, is to be able to draw bond line structures. You wanna eliminate the hydrogens that are not part of a functional group, place them in a zigzag, and make sure you have the correct number of carbons represented in the correct bond angles. So here's one to try, right from your homework where it says practice the skill. Let's try working through going from what we call a complete Lewis dot structure to a bond line structure. So I'd recommend figuring out how many carbons we have straight across, and I'm going to just draw one, two, three, four, five carbons in a row, eliminating the H's. I notice on carbon two, there's a methyl group, a carbon coming out. I notice on carbon four, there's a methyl coming up and down, right? There's a CH3 and a CH3, and finally ending with CH3. This carbon has two groups of CH3s on it, CH3 taken twice and another hydrogen. It leads to a CH2 group, which leads to a carbon who has 
CH3 taken three times. There's three methyl groups. That's practicing going from Lewis dot to what we call the condensed formula. And that's a skill in this chapter as well. So I thought I would just kind of sprinkle in those practices as best we can. CH3 taken three times. That didn't come out right. But anyway, we're trying to get to a bond line structure. So I've removed all of the hydrogens and just showed the connectivity. All right. Then it says, let's, and again, there's no functional group with this example. So we're just talking about zigzags. We have five carbons to put in a bond line formula. Alrighty, so that says one, two, three, four, five. Those carbons, if I numbered them one through five, I've just placed in a zigzag one, two, three, four, five. On carbon number two, we had a methyl group. On carbon number four, there's two methyl groups. And remember, we want to kind of create the least amount of crowding as possible. So I'm going to place both methyl groups pointing up so I don't have one sterically hindered between carbon three and five. There's our structure. We have at carbon two and at carbon four, some of those branches that come out. So there you have letter A drawn correctly. There was the next one we could try together. CH3, CH2 taken three times COH. This is what we call the condensed formula. So this is allowing us to try to figure out connectivity as well as going to the bond line formula. So this carbon has three groups of two carbons each. So notice what I've done, CH3, CH2. And again, I'm just going to leave off these hydrogens because I'm going to take them off anyway. There's two carbons inside this parenthesis telling me that three, three units of those are attached to that particular carbon, leaving the OH as the functional group for the fourth bond. So that's moving from condensed to the connectivity of the molecule. How many carbons are in the longest chain as it looks one, two, three? <clears throat> Notice that I can count from any direction. I get three carbons. And there's a five carbon chain this direction. One, two, three, four, five. So I'm going to choose to write that as one, two, three, four, five. And these dots I'm just helping us see is carbon one, two, three, four, five. Now what about carbon three? Carbon three has some attachments. I need another ethyl group and an OH group. And just based on crowding, I'm going to put the second ethyl group here, which is two more carbons, and then an OH group here. Now how many ways is there to draw this? I could have done one, two, three, Here's an OH group coming there. And then I have an ethyl group coming again out and down. That's the same exact molecule. We just drew it a little different. Remember, all these single bonds have freedom to rotate. So there's just more than one right answer in terms of spatial arrangement. So keep in mind, I could spin these molecules in any direction. One thing I made a mistake here of, that is a bond that leads directly to oxygen. That's my bad. I'm going to erase and correct that. Thank you. There's no carbon to the oxygen. It's directly from this center. There we go. Alrighty. And so when you have that drawn, you have a feel of something like this. We have one two, three, four, five carbons in the longest chain. We have an ethyl group as the third of the four bonds going to this alcohol functional group. This is a long one. 
And this is one that you're gonna be asked to draw on. So we'll take our time and go through that. And the first step I would say is, let's get connectivity figured out and eliminate hydrogens on the way. CH3, CH2, CH2 taken three times tells me this carbon has three units of carbon attached to it as three of its four bonds. So CH3, CH, you know, three of those carbons on this carbon. The next one leads to an oxygen. The next one leads to a CH2 group. Then a CH2 group, eliminating the CH2s. Then a CH, CH. Between carbon three and four will be that double bond. So there's one, two, three, four. And then how many in a row? One, two more. And then I have an oxygen. And then another carbon. And that carbon has two carbon chains coming off in three different directions. So that's me eliminating the hydrogens and getting a feel of connectivity going from a condensed structure to kind of the beginning of what we'll call the line dot structure. This carbon right here, and let's just make that a dot so we are gonna to move to the line dot structure. This carbon, let's make him purple so I can tell you that this is the carbon I'm drawing and it leads to a one, two, three carbon bond zigzag. That's kind of straight. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. That's a straight line. Then what does it go? It goes to an oxygen. Then we have one, two, three carbons before the double bond, right? So this should actually come down. See how pra practice this takes? Let's make this come down so that we can make sure we follow the zigzag. Then it will come up. Carbon one, two, three. And then I notice that to go to carbon four, we have a double bond, but it's still in a zigzag. Five, six, five, six. Then I have an oxygen. Then it leads to a carbon. That's this guy. And that carbon has two carbons coming off in three directions. So here's the first direction. This could be the second direction. And this could be the third direction. Just making it sterically you know, spaced out, if you will. That's a big molecule. So again, see how much practice it takes. And you can see that um, the double bond is there for sp2. We have our lone sets of electrons on there. And each of those carbons has been represented with just part of the line. You get a lot of practice with that, no worries. <laughs> now the next topic and this is where I say this is just a memory, a drill game. It's functional groups. Your job is to memorize so you can recognize and label functional groups within a hydrocarbon chain. Now, a functional group is defined as an atom or a group of atoms with characteristic chemical and physical properties. A functional group will contain a heteroatom. Remember this definition? It's any atom other than a carbon or a hydrogen. It will contain a multiple bond, either a double or a triple, or sometimes it contains both, a multiple bond and a heteroatom. You have this carbon backbone, which is denoted by the letter R. You have a line, which means bonded to, and then some particular functional group. And those are the functional groups we're about to present and you're working to memorize. The carbon and hydrogen portion is used to, uh, as the letter R, just so we can see what that means. So the first of the hydrocarbon functional groups 
hydrocarbons, remember these only contain carbons and hydrogens, no, no other hetero atom. We'll learn that the functional group that ends in ane, alkanes, really are the backbone of all uh, hydrocarbon molecules, all contain single bonds. And when we'll have a chapter devoted to alkanes, no other functional groups, only single to single chemical bonds uh, for carbon to carbon, very boring molecules, we'll learn that they're called alkanes. All carbon to carbon single. If we have a carbon to carbon double bond, we'll call those alkenes. And if we have a carbon to carbon triple bond, 180 degrees, we're gonna to learn to call those alkynes. And the aromatic compounds, aromatic compounds contain a benzene ring, which is a six-sided cyclic structure with alternating single double bonds. An alkane contains only single bonds, an alkene contains double bond, an alkyne contains a triple bond, and the aromatic compound contains the benzene ring, and the benzene ring will alternate double, single, double, single around a six-sided cyclic structure. These are the hydrocarbon functional groups to memorize. Here are some functional groups that contain carbon bonded to a heteroatom using a single bond. For example, the functional group called an alkyl halide. The halide represents the halogens, which will be fluorine, chlorine, bromine, or iodine. Those are the group 7A halogens. An example might be methyl bromide, where we have a bromine attached to the hydrocarbon. The R X general formula represents whatever this hydrocarbon chain is attached to whatever halogen is there. It's called an alkyl halide. The second carbon to heteroatom single bond functional group is called an alcohol. We have a, a carbon chain attached to a hydroxyl group, OH, known as an alcohol. So again, this will have zigzag uh, in terms of its blonde structure, but an OH is an alcohol, and we'll learn to name those ending in OL. An ether is a carbon to oxygen to carbon single bond, ROR, are called ethers. An amine has a nitrogen group attached to the hydrocarbon chain. Now it says for an amine, if this nitrogen is attached to two other hydrogens, it's called a primary amine. If this nitrogen is attached to two other carbons and a hydrogen, it's called a secondary amine. And if the nitrogen is attached to three carbons, then it's called a tertiary amine primary, secondary, or tertiary amines all fall under the N to a hydrocarbon bond. So this would be primary, secondary, or tertiary amines. And the thiol group, very similar to the alcohol group, remember on the periodic table in group 6A, oxygen is in period two, sulfur is in period three, both of these have very similar chemical properties in terms of bonding. Sulfur and oxygen both will form two single or need two bonds and two lone pairs. And so the thiol group is RSH, whereas the alcohol group is ROH. You'll see that they have very similar properties based on the location on the periodic table. So let's process, let's just a little practice here. Can you recognize the functional groups? You wanna pause? Take a minute and just mentally think. You ready to talk about them? All I'm gonna do is highlight what they are and see if we can name them. The first one, of course, I see an OH. When I label that, it comes out as an alcohol functional group. The next one in letter B, 
I have this particular substance, which is the entire benzene ring, and I have this, which is the alkene. So to name those, here you would have an aromatic compound, and here you would have an alkene. Aromatic is referred to as the benzene ring. Whoops, I didn't finish spelling, benzene ring. How about in letter C? Here I notice an NH2, and at the end I notice an NH2. Those are the same functional groups. Those are primary amines. Both of them are the same. They are bonded to one carbon and two hydrogens. How about in these? Here I'm noticing I have an alcohol group. Here I have a double bond, so that's an alkene. Here's another double bond, so that's also an alkene. And that's all I see. Here I have a fluorine. Oh my goodness, look at all these fluorines. That, all of those there attached to carbon, this would be kind of what that Rx was, it's called an alkyl halide. And I also have this particular linkage, which is ROR, which we're learning to call an ether. And here is a nitrogen attached to three carbons. We're practicing that this is called a tertiary amine, a nitrogen attached to three other carbons for the three bonds it requires. You have to practice, it's drill work, no getting around it, you've gotta memorize these. Let's take a look at functional groups that contain a multiple bond. For instance, the double bond carbon to oxygen. This is known as a carbonyl. The carbonyl group is a C double bond O, and it really contains quite a few different functional groups depending upon what's out here in terms of what else is attached to it. So the carbonyl carbon to double bond represents quite a few functional groups. For example, we have an aldehyde, ketone, carboxylic acid, ester, and amide that we have to memorize. The aldehyde has the carbonyl group, C double bond O, at the end of the carbon chain. So I'll write terminal. That's why it's ending with a hydrogen. So if the carbon in the carbonyl group is attached to a hydrogen, it's called an aldehyde. When we name these, we'll have names that end with AL. If the carbonyl carbon, remember this is the carbonyl group, if it's attached to a hydrogen, it's an aldehyde. But if it's attached to carbons on both sides, so I'm gonna say that it's in the chain. This is what we refer to as a ketone. So notice that the carbonyl carbon, instead of being at the terminal end of the chain, it's within the chain, it's now a ketone. A carboxylic acid is a functional group where the carbon is attached to a hydroxyl group making it an acid. This is the acidic proton for this acid. So coo, you'll hear me say that quite a bit in class, this functional group of COOH, sometimes you see abbreviated CO2H, has the carbonyl group attached to a hydroxyl group, COOH. So again, this has to be at the terminal end so that the H can be in place. If we have the carbonyl carbon attached to an oxygen not at the terminal end, instead of a hydrogen here, we have another carbon group, it's called an ester. So notice the difference. If it's in the carbon chain, it's an ester. If it's at the end, it's called a carboxylic acid. And finally, if we have this nitrogen group directly next to the carbonyl carbon, it's called an amide. 
So the nitrogen group here is attached directly to a carbonyl carbon. That functional group in its entirety is known as the amide. Now remember, just to kind of make a distinction, if we had a nitrogen that's attached to carbons, but none of those carbons have a double bond involved, we call that an amine. And amide says the nitrogen is directly next door to a carbonyl group. That takes a little practice to recognize. So again, aldehyde at the terminal end, the carbonyl group is attached to a hydrogen. You'll see that in a, a condensed structure written as CHO. Now that's important because if we compare that to COH, if you just reversed the order of the O and the H, you now have an alcohol group that the hydrogen is attached to the oxygen. But when I write it as CHO, we write it in terms of an aldehyde. Very carefully make that note. Carboxylic acids, when I write in condensed structure, you see this coo. Sometimes you'll see it as CO2H. COOH lets us know that it's a carbonyl group bonded to the OH, a carboxylic acid. In an acetate, uh, an ester such as ethyl acetate has the carbonyl carbon attached to an OR group all as one functional group. So when you see that abbreviated, you'll see COO and then the remaining R portion, or you might see the two representing those two oxygens in a row. The amide, just to repeat myself, the amide is the nitrogen group that's directly next to the carbonyl carbon. If you have a nitrogen directly attached to a carbon, but that carbon does not have a double bond oxygen, it's known as an amine. If its neighbor is carbonyl, it's amide. If its neighbor is not a carbonyl group, it's an amine. Take some practice, drill work, my friends. You might wanna pause the video and just try some. What are these functional groups? Try them out. This is a homework shot if you wanted to try. I see a double bond, alkene. I see an OH, that's an alcohol. I see a carbonyl carbon. C double bond O is a carbonyl. That carbon is attached to two other carbons. This is a ketone. Here's some more for us. Again, I just picked some from your homework. Here is a CHO. That's telling me that this carbon is double bonded to an oxygen and the terminal end is a hydrogen. This is an aldehyde. Here I see COOH, which tells me that it's C double bond O, OH. This is a carboxylic acid. This looks very familiar to the previous example, a carbonyl carbon, right? Carbonyl group, double bond, C double bond O, going to two other carbons. This is a ketone. Here I have CO2 bonded to another carbon. So keep in mind, that's what it looks like. C double bond O, O, and then it has two more carbons after it. And of course the other side, but this functional group here is known as an ester. Instead of the hydrogen, we have a carbon group, so the carboxylic acid turns to an ester. Here we have a carbonyl group directly attached to the nitrogen, and so this we've learned is called the amide functional group.
That's the skill level that we're looking for for quizzes and tests or homework is being able to recognize and name the functional groups as you appear. Now, one of the most common things I notice about uh, you know, mistakes made is between an ether, which is R-O-R, and a ketone, which is R-C carbonyl R, it's hard to tell from condensed structure, so I thought we would practice a few here. And again, it just lies in figuring out how the things are attached to each other. This oxygen has two identical groups attached to it. That's our CH3 groups. So when I think of going from letter A to the condensed formula to a structural formula, we have an ROR. This is an ether group. Here's letter B. Notice that C is directly bonded to the O, so I have this functional group right off the bat, and on either side of them is a, a methyl group, a CH3. So just based on the carbon-oxygen being next to each other, they're bonded. So this, of course, is a ketone. This is bonded together, so I have a C double bond O, and then on both sides comes out two carbon groups, CH3, CH2, on both directions. That would represent a ketone. And here, the oxygen is actually part of the structure. Out in one direction, we have two carbons. In the other direction, we have one carbon and attached to it is CH3s. So it looks like this. Of course, I left out the hydrogens. But since this is part of the backbone, this is what we call an ether. So this looks so easy as I sit and do the examples, but I'm encouraging you to really try them out on your own. Get to the point where you can recognize all of the functional groups. When I see a CO2, I want you to envision that as being a carbonyl carbon bonded to another oxygen, and that leads out to another chain of carbons. So this is your ester. This particular oxygen is bonded to two other carbons. This is what we called an ether. A double bond is what we call an alkene. Here's a nitrogen, and it's not connected to a carbonyl group, so this is an amine. Here is a nitrogen directly attached to a carbonyl, so this is what we called the amide. I think we got them all. And there they are. The Tamiflu identifying all functional groups labeled. So again, this is one that's presented in your text, and I kind of grabbed different things and just based on uh, the ease of reading. Go into your text, table 2.1, use this video from the notes, whatever you find, but you need to work to, to go through and memorize each of these functional groups. We've went through them one by one. We've kind of given examples of how to identify and that's where we're looking at in terms of the skill is being able to look at a compound and be able to determine its functional groups. So that, let's suppose this is a test question. I can see I have a functional group, I'm just highlighting this whole thing as a functional group. This is a functional group. Can you name those functional groups? Here I have a nitrogen that's attached to hydrogen and two other carbons, and none of those is a carbonyl carbon, so that is a secondary amine. Here is an alcohol group. This is an S, oops, I'm sorry, this is an ether, R-O-R. -R. This is an aromatic benzene ring. This here is the amide. That's where we're heading to, and until you can do that with some confidence, you know, keep drill work, keep those flashcards going, we have to be able to get that 
uh, really proficient and, and just kind of laying out every one of those functional groups leads to the next chapter. So it's kind of giving you the table of contents of, of our of our journey together in organic chemistry, studying each one of those functional groups, what's, what makes it unique, what is its reactivity, how do, what kind of reagents and so forth. So that's why they're so important to uh, consider now. And so when we think about just example after example, um, labeling out each one of those. I'm going to conclude the video here. It's been a long journey and I'll, I'll just make another short one to conclude this, but uh, come back when you're ready. I'm running low on battery power, so I'm going to just stop uh, the video and start rendering it and pick up in a moment.